Arlene Foster, looking forward to talking about your life and times in politics. Um, I'm going to start by talking about a, a childhood defined by the Troubles. Mm. Your father was shot in the head by the IRA. How old were you? What is the impact on you personally? So we lived quite rurally, very close to the border with the Irish Republic. My father was a, a police officer. Um, he used to come home quite late at night from duty. And on this occasion, I think the IRA thought he was coming home late that evening and they hid behind a hedge quite close to our house. Um, as it was, he was actually in the house. He wasn't coming home, um, but he'd gone out to close in cattle for the evening, about half nine, ten o'clock. And I was just eight and a half at the time. My brother was four. Um, and you could hear the rapid gunfire. Of course, when you're that age, you didn't know what it was. And you looked at your mother, who was sitting there deadly still. And then daddy came in crawling on all fours with blood coming from his head, ushered us all upstairs um, because, because of where we lived. He had flares in the house to alert um, the security forces if there was an attack on him, put off the flares. And we all had to lie on the floor then until um, about seven, eight minutes later, help came. But, you know, at the time, it was, it is a very stark memory, obviously, for me. Um, but other things could have happened. We understand that the, the gun that was used to try and kill my father jammed. If it hadn't jammed, would they have come after him into the house? Uh, there's a whole load of imponderables, but my father survived. Um, we had to move away from our home then to an, in quote, safer area, which was a big um, strain on the family because my grandmother lived with us. She was in her 80s had always lived in the countryside, and then we were moving to a town. Um, and uh, it was very different and very difficult at that time. But my father survived, and we're always very thankful for that because there are so many people who were attacked at that time in the late 70s and through into the 1980s who didn't survive. And uh, we're very thankful that he lived for another 32 years after that. What's the impact on an eight-and-a-half-year-old's mental health of going through yeah. something like that. Children, are, it's, it's always said, are, are quite resilient, but mm. perhaps there are... I think I, we were, I was quite resilient, and I put that down to my parents, uh, and the fact that they protected us from uh, that. They um, give us support. They made us feel safe. And I think the fact that I do recall after it, uh, before we moved house, it was about a month uh, where we stayed in the house before we moved to uh, Listen Ski, which then became our home. I do recall at night when I went to bed, I, I pulled the covers over my head as if that would secure me, if you know what I mean, and nobody would see me if somebody came um, to the house. So obviously there was an impact. Um, but at that time, Unlike today, there's no services. Um, and it's actually one of the things that developed after the Inniskillen bomb of 1987, that services were put in place to support people. Um, and the Oma bomb, of course, in 1998. So services have developed, and I'm thankful for that, particularly for young people, because, of course, very recently, um, when Detective Chief Inspector John Caldwell the attempted murder on him, his young son was present and seen all of that happening. Um, and I really hope that he gets all of the support that he needs um, to get through what has been an awful experience for him as well. And then the IRA blow up your school bus later on. How old were you when that happened? So that was 1988. Um, and they targeted the school bus because our bus driver was a part-time member of uh, the Ulster Defence Regiment. He was a soldier part-time. And uh, the bomb was under the front of the bus, but whatever happened, it didn't go off until there were about 20 children on the bus, uh, including myself. Uh, again, thankfully, um, I wasn't physically injured, but the girl sitting beside me was very badly physically injured. Uh, I'm very glad to say she came through it. Uh, and uh, came through it very well. But, 
you know, it was a terrible time. And sometimes when I look back now, I'm very thankful that my children haven't had to live through what I lived through. Um, that's not to say I didn't have a happy childhood. I did have a happy childhood, a very happy childhood. And again, I put that down to the fact that my parents made it as normal as possible in what were abnormal circumstances. And during your first term as First Minister mm. of Northern Ireland, your deputy yeah. is the former IRA commander, Martin McGuinness. What was the most difficult part of, of working together? Well, I was very aware of who Martin McGuinness was because I'd been in the executive um, since 2007. Um, he had been the Deputy First Minister for all of that time. And um, I'd seen the way that he had operated. I, I knew his history. I knew he was an IRA commander. I knew he had also been to the, the, the man who was suspected of trying to murder my father was later killed by the SAS as he was going to do other deeds. And Martin McGuinness gave a eulogy at his funeral about what a great guy he was. So I knew exactly who I was dealing with. But I also had to recognise that he had been voted in to that particular position. I had been voted in to the position I was holding. And to try and build for the future, I had to try and deal with um, my feelings towards him, my feelings towards the IRA, um, to try and move things forward. And I'm not going to tell you it was easy, Gloria, because it wasn't, it was difficult. Um, but I think it was the right thing to do. I, I mean, other people didn't think it was the right thing to do. Uh, and I absolutely acknowledge that and have a lot of empathy from where they came from. But in order to move things forward in Northern Ireland, I felt it was the right thing to do. And uh, that's why I, I shared power with him. So that was between 2016 and 2017. Then you are First Minister again from 2020 to 2021. Mm. You're leader of the Democratic Unionist Party from 2015 to 2021. The first woman to hold either yes. of those positions. Do you think you were treated differently in politics because you were the first woman to hold those positions? Yes, I, I think in a positive way and in a negative way as well. Um, because you're the first woman, there's a lot of positivity, uh, particularly for young women. Um, and after I stepped down, the amount of letters and emails and correspondence I received, particularly from young women right across the political spectrum, um, was that they hadn't realised how important it was to have a female First Minister until I stepped down, actually. So that, that was a positive thing. And now when I see young women coming forward and putting themselves forward, despite all of the pressure, despite all of the abuse on social media, I think that is a good thing. And I hope I played a part in, in trying to push more women into uh, coming forward into politics. Obviously, on the negative piece, you are judged in a different way. So your looks, what you dress, what your what clothes are, how your hair is. <laughs> you know, um, if you're strong, you're, sh you're seen to be shrill and aggressive, whereas a man would be seen to be, you know, uh, on the money and, and, forth, right? yeah. uh, and uh, being a good leader. So th there are different ways women politicians are looked at than men. I hope there will come a time when that's not the case, but I think we're in the transitional period at the moment uh, and, and women are still judged in a different way from men. And when I see the caricatures uh, uh, of some of our leading female politicians of Westminster, I think that wouldn't be the same for a man. And when I signed the Confidence and Supply Agreement with Theresa May uh, in 2017, uh, some of the caricatures of me in some of the mainstream press over here were not just racist, they were completely sexist. I mean, I think there was one in the Times of me in a bowler hat with a five o'clock shadow. Um, and it was dreadful. And I see Pretty Patel, I see Suella Braverman, uh, I see uh, Labour politicians uh, being treated just because they're female in a different way. And it's wrong. Uh, and it really does need to be called out. Let's talk about that uh, Theresa May government, mm. when the support of your party helped to keep Theresa May in power. The predictions are that the next mm. general election could well result in a hung parliament. Any advice for your successors about whether you should play a similar role in supporting either party, whoever is the biggest party? Mm. 
Well, I, I'm looking with interest um, at the uh, polls at the moment and the possibility of a hung parliament coming again. And um, at that time, we took a decision not to go into formal coalition, but to go into a confidence and supply agreement where we would support on, on particular issues, particularly uh, around Brexit at that time. Um, and to bring benefit for the people of Northern Ireland, which we did through the through the arrangements. Um, and I think if it happens at the next general election again, the party leader will have to decide whether, what sort of, if, and if he's asked to help, um, he'll have to decide whether to go into coalition, whether to go into a confidence and supply agreement, whether it's good for the people of Northern Ireland, whether it's good for the nation as a whole, which is one of the reasons why we did it. We felt we were allowing the nation to honour the Brexit vote which had taken place. Um, so there's a whole load of imponderables, but I'll watch very carefully and with interest if it happens the next time around. And would it be fanciful to even think that there could ever be a any sort of agreement with the Labour Party in the DU? No, I don't think so. I don't think so at all. Um, and I think there is quite good relationships with the Secretary of State for Northern Ireland, the Shadow Secretary of State for Northern Ireland, Peter Kyle, uh, and indeed uh, with Sir Keir as well. So no, not at all. Let's look at last week's local elections. Mm. Sinn Féin, nationalist Sinn Féin, now the biggest party in local government. Are there lessons to be learned from those elections about how you restore faith in your party? Well, the, the DUP, which I'm not a member of anymore, but the DUP... Um, what, why not? I left after the um, I was removed <laughs> right. by okay. uh, the Assembly team and I felt the best thing for me to do was to leave the party at that time. And I so I sit as a non-affiliated peer in the House of Lords. Um, obviously, I'm still a very strong unionist and will continue to advocate for the union. And indeed, I've set up a foundation to do just that called Together UK, um, and which works with all of the parties across the UK, not just one particular party. So leaving one particular party has left has allowed me to sit right across unionism and not just in one particular party. So that's uh, probably why. But yes, I think the DUP had a good election, actually. They retained uh, all of their seats. They went in with 122 seats. They came back out with 122 seats. And that was despite all of the pressure that was being put on by not least our own government here in Westminster. So they had a pretty good election. Um, in general, Sinn Féin have absolutely consolidated their position as the largest nationalist party and indeed the largest party. Um, they picked up a lot of seats from the SDLP, which is the smaller nationalist party, uh, wiped out quite a few independent members as well. So they had a very good election. But if you look at the percentage of the vote, actually, in terms of nationalism versus unionism, not much has changed in 25 years, Gloria. And that's something that people are missing because the growth of Sinn Féin is actually at the expense of the of Social the Democratic Party. and Labour Party, okay. you know, and that, that's where the key element is. So in terms of all of the clamour for a border poll, not much has changed in 25 years. Do you think there will be a border poll in your lifetime? No, I don't. Well, there shouldn't be because there isn't the support uh, for change in terms of leaving the United Kingdom. Because I think most people, uh, even though they have sympathy uh, with the Republic of Ireland, recognise that they're better off within the United Kingdom structure. Final question. It's, it's gone so quickly, this. I'm really enjoying <laughs> this chat. <laughs> I wish I had longer. Um, there's two famous Arlene's in this country. <laughs> there is yourself. Only two? <laughs> I'm sure there's more than that. <laughs> there is yourself. And the choreographer and former Strictly Come Dancing judge, Arlene Phillips. And we're both dames as well, which makes it even <laughs> more confusing. But sometimes in, in interviews, yes, uh, political interviews, and people get your name uh, confused and they call you Arlene Phillips. Does it annoy you or do you laugh it off? I feel more sorry for Arlene Phillips, uh, actually, who's um, probably fed up with her name being used when I'm being interviewed. But uh, I have a lot of respect for Arlene Phillips. I think she was absolutely brilliant in Strictly Come Dancing at the start of Strictly yeah, Come yeah, Dancing. Yeah. I love Strictly Come Dancing. I watch it religiously. But I thought she was absolutely brilliant to see. And to see another Arlene on screen <laughs> like that, who was absolutely brilliant at her job, uh, was wonderful. So, yes, I probably feel rather... Sorry for Arlene Phillips when she's referenced instead of me. <laughs> Would you do Strictly Come Dancing? Oh, I don't think I'd be fit to do uh, Strictly Come Dancing, but I do love it and I think it's a wonderful programme. That was a wonderful chat. I thoroughly enjoyed it. Arlene Foster had to check that. <laughs>
Arlene Foster, thank you so much. Thank you, Gloria.